I'll, um, thank you, Roger. And uh, good evening, all. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, naval history and tradition is part of our heritage. And I think it's important to keep it alive. And uh, I was quite pleased to have this opportunity to talk about HMS Pickle. And if I appear to be reading from a script, it's probably because I am, and I apologize for that. <laughs> I've, got, I've got great respect for the men who, who served in the Navy at the time of Trafalgar. There were no engines, no winches, no waterproofs, no life jackets, meager rations, the list goes on. And yet, they kept up morale and stayed at sea for months. Um, and uh, it wasn't that long ago either. If a, if a lifetime is three score years and ten, then it's only three lifetimes away. My interest in pickle began in 2005 when I was looking, seeking a name for our new Do 434. It was the bicentenary of Trafalgar, and so I decided to look at the names of Nelson ships. And I came across this painting of HMS Pickle, and that settled it very quickly. Um, so I've been interested really in all things Pickle since then. Now, so my talk is about that Pickle, HMS Pickle, and this HMS Pickle. This is the Pickle of today. And also about their skippers. On, on the right, we have uh, John Richard Lapon Etier, very difficult to say, I find. And on the left, we have Mal Nicholson. Lapon Etier, the uh, career Navy officer, and Mal Nicholson, the engineer, entrepreneur, eccentric, and the owner of fast cars and slow boats. Now, there are differing accounts of the history and, and the activities of HMS Pickle. So I'm just going to tell you about the bits I like best. She was built in Bermuda in 1799, and she was named Sting. She was a privateer, which is another name for a licensed pirate ship, and her timbers were cedar, which was an excellent material, and it was um, the reason why a boat building industry thrived in, um, in Bermuda at that time. In fact, over a thousand ships of small size were built in Bermuda during the 18th century. Now, the design of um, hulls and rigs was moving on in the, uh, the new world, world where um, it, there was free thinking. Whereas over here in the old world, we were very conservative. The, the um, Bermuda cedar was popular because it was strong, light. It didn't need to be seasoned. It was durable and it was resistant to rot. Uh, when I went ashore after the 1963 Bermuda race, I noticed that there weren't very many trees around. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it wasn't for that reason. It was um, that uh, an imported instinct, uh, insect had um, killed them off, all eight million of them. And um, fortunately, there were a few, a few that survived. And um, they produced resistant seeds. And luckily, the, these wonderful trees are going back again in Bermuda, but slowly. Sting was 73 foot long and 20 foot wide. She just about fit in this room. She had uh, a bowsprit 25 foot long, which uh, was sloped upwards to keep it out of the head seas. Um, a draft of 10 foot, and uh, she weighed about 130 tons. From the bottom of the hold to deck level was only nine feet. There was a captain's cabin, a saloon, a galley, and then the rest was divided into a hold and um, accommodation. 
and accommodation had a headroom of four and a half feet. And how 35 men ever lived there together, it, it beats me. On deck there was a tiller which was about as high, about as long as that beam is from the ceiling. Uh, when the going got tough, it took four men to, to man it. 14 gun ports, but she never carried 14 guns. Seems quite a good policy to have lots of gun ports because any enemy thinks you've got lots more guns than you have. And it also allows you to move guns around the deck. When um, La Pont Etier joined the ship in 1802, when she was in the UK, he very quickly moved uh, four of the ten guns he had down into the hold to improve stability. And this might be a reflection of the fact that she was built for the West Indies and she was then having to go through Atlantic storms. Uh, also on deck there were a couple of rowing boats stacked one on top of the other, but the keys to her success were her rig and her shape. She had the two mainsails and three jibs, which made her go better to windward than the men of war. Downwind, she had the topsail as well. And this is a picture of the new pickle, hence the propeller. Underwater, rather than the, the men of war, which were shaped like barrels, she had a, a wine glass shape, gave her to a much better grip on water, so there was less, less leeway. She was also sheathed in copper, and the link between uh, a clean bottom and speed was clearly known because in the five years, 1803 to 1808, she went ashore into a dry dock on eight occasions. So that's almost twice a year to be cleaned and for the um, copper to be checked over. So she was fast, weatherly, agile and well-armed. In fact, a pocket battleship. Our man in the West Indies at that time was Admiral Lord Hugh Seymour, handsome looking chap. He was based in Jamaica uh, at a time when there was constant warfare involving France, Spain, Portugal, Holland, America, and ourselves. There were pirates prowling around as well. Admiral Seymour had around 20 ships of all sizes, including an armed tender called Pickle. Fascinating idea for me to have an armed tender. Uh, little is known about this ship, this Pickle, but it seems that Seymour didn't like her very much. Maybe she was slow and long past her well by, uh, sell by date. However, he took a fancy to Sting, and uh, in 1800, he uh, started chartering her for a tenner a day. Then, a while later, rather than pay the daily fee, he bought her for two and a half grand. Um, this was a direct contravention of an order from the, uh, our lords at the Admiralty, who had told him not to buy any more ships. <laughs> But then Jamaica was a long way from London, and really he could more or less do what he liked. He quietly retired his pickle, his arm tender, and uh, gave her name to Sting. Now a British ship, the new pickle, took part in several successful engagements. Admiral Seymour died in September 1801. He was only 42 years old and a victim of yellow fever. And you might also say he was a victim of his own greed, because he got this posting in, the, in Jamaica in order to make money from prizes. His body was put in a lead-lined coffin, returned to England, interestingly, on board Pickle, the new Pickle. His body was being returned for a family funeral. Pickle made a swift passage and arrived in Portsmouth. The lordships were now perplexed. They had two Pickles on their books. One they'd sent out to the West Indies, and, and this other one was had turned up in Portsmouth. And the man who could solve their problem was dead. Naval architects went down to uh, Portsmouth to survey the new ship, and they were mightily impressed with what they saw. They drew her lines, and they created a new class of ship, which they called a Adonis class. And in 1804, the Admiralty uh, ordered 12 more pickles to be built in Bermuda. In uh, May 1802, La Ponentier came on board uh, as skipper. Now 32, uh, he had joined the Navy as a 10-year-old, so he already had 22 years of experience, and he'd already sailed around the world twice. He was still only a lieutenant. Promotion had not come, some say, because he had no patron, or that he was never in the right place at the right time. But it may have been that his name held him back. Although he was a Huguenot, France was our perennial enemy. He had a very French name. Could he be trusted? Maybe not. 
my own family is Huguenot, and our surname was Ombre, and it was anglicised to Humphrey, and uh, that seemed to be more acceptable. So Fickel was uh, moved to Plymouth, and uh, Stonehouse Pool became her base. That's the area we now know as the Mayflower Marina. She became principally a dispatch vessel uh, because she was fast and agile, always in demand because this was the fastest means of communication. She was worked hard and covered thousands of miles, including one Atlantic crossing, several trips to the Mediterranean, but mostly to the fleets uh, blockading Brest and uh, Cadiz. She was one of Nelson's favourites, as witnessed by this dispatch uh, from the Mediterranean, which begins, when she is repaired, send me pickle. This dispatch is actually framed and hangs on the wall in the library at the Royal Yacht Squadron. The frequent voyages, all under always under pressure to deliver at speed, and the cold and the wet and the cramped accommodation made the ship unpopular with the men, and the desertion became very common. One year, she lost uh, a third of her crew, and they were very difficult to replace. The Navy management were also a bit worried about Bonentier himself, because although he was doing a great job, he needed relief because he was never in his bed at night. The first role was dispatched. The second role was gaining intelligence. But because she was nimble, she could go close into enemy shorelines and be confident of getting away again. And she went close into both Brest and Cadiz to do an accurate account of the ships that were in port. On occasions also, she would be sent in to capture a small coaster or a fishing boat so that the crew could be inter interrogated about what was going on on shore. A third role was as a fighting ship. And this slide shows just how successful she was. Uh, 16 prizes, some in, joint, uh, in uh, joint engagements and some acting on her own. Looking at this list and the variety of nations, I wonder if anybody actually knew who they were at war with, <laughs> particularly when they were stationed in the West Indies. Was it actually all about prize money and winner takes all? She was at Trafalgar, but uh, lurking around in the background, picking up survivors. She was so successful at rescue that one stage she had 150 Frenchmen on board. And when they were heard plotting to take over the ship, they were battened down below. And that must have been a terrible squash. It was um, the dash home from Trafalgar with the Trafalgar dispatches that brought fame and fortune to Lapon Etier and the promotion he so richly deserved. And what was the first thing he did? He had his portrait painted. Many of you will have seen the um, Kathy Brown's excellent talk about the trip home. And if you missed it, there is a recording on it on the website. In 1805, uh, Pickle returned her dispatch role uh, uh, under a new skipper. And in July 1808, she came to grief, a victim of her own speed, uh, when she hit Chipiana Shoal or Cadiz at night. The, there is a cardinal mark there now, and the, the, the chart shows a wreck. So that might be the Pickle. But um, if ever you're passing, spare a pot thought for pickle. It doesn't all add up to me because at dusk she was off Cape Santa Maria, so it was said. And then she was going to sail across the bay and then heave to during the night when they reckoned she got halfway and then heave to and wait for daylight. But there she is, she's 15 degrees off course and she seems to have covered an incredible amount of miles in a very short time because it wasn't long after midnight that she hit the, the shoal. No one drowned um, and uh, the dispatches were covered a few days later by a diver. Uh, the skipper faced a court martial but um, he was exonerated. So this pickle had gone but her name lives on. There have been eight Navy ships, all small, named pickle since then and the last one was a World War II minesweeper. So that was HMS Pickle number one. Today's Pickle is one of five that were built uh, in St. Petersburg for a, a, um, a commemoration of the city's maritime past. Similar in dimension, shape, and sail plan, 
to h and people they look alike they aren't replicas two of the five found their way over here this one is called uh, Elena Maria Barbara. She's undergone a, a major refit in uh, a tent in Cardiff Bay. Uh, the heart and deck <clears throat> are now replanked, but there is still work, work to be done. The knockdown price is 125k, and it may cost around 600k to complete the project. If anybody here is interested, it would be wonderful if she came to Butler's Hard and that became her, ba her base. The other one was renamed uh, HMS Pickle. She had obviously had a, originally a Russian name and toured the UK in 2005 as part of the Trafalgar 200 commemoration. Back in her home port of Holyhead, she became the star of one of Tom Cunliffe's episodes of an excellent BBC series called The Boats That Built Britain. After that, the owner decided to uh, put her up for sale. In a moment of madness, I contacted Tom Cunliffe and asked his opinion. He said, unfortunately, she's built a softwood and was rotting. So I quickly lost interest. It wasn't a great reflection on, on the builders who built her in Russia. There weren't any offers in the UK, funny enough. And so the owner took her down to Gibraltar. And there she became a tourist attraction. But he still wanted to sell, so he put her on eBay. <laughs> now, Mal Nicholson, who lives in Hull, bought her off eBay, unseen. When he got down to Gibraltar, she was almost in a sinking condition. He took her northward um, towards, uh, uh, towards the UK, but broke his mast off Portugal and ended up in Portimao where she had a major, major refit, including 40 tons of new timbers. Britain's most famous old warships is set to sail from Portugal to a new home on the Humber following months of restoration. The finishing touches are being made to HMS Pickle by a team from North Lincolnshire after the unique ship fell into ruin. Crispin Rolf has more. There you go, that is the total extent of the port side repair. Back to her bones, a rotting replica of HMS Pickle. Now almost restored by a North Lincolnshire team in Portugal after she'd been left to rot in Gibraltar. It wasn't apparent until you started removing planks just what the state of affairs really was. You know, what we're looking at now is the finishing touches. All of the hull planking's on, all of the new frames, all of the new deck beams have been installed. You're looking at a vessel that's now got the integrity that she needs to go to sea. It was quite upsetting to see what the state of the boat was in. And I think another 12 months or 18 months and this would not have been saved. It would have gone. And it had been a loss for the country. This is HMS Pickle in better days, marking the Battle of Trafalgar, which made the original famous by bringing back news of victory to England. But when the modern day version sails shortly, it'll be for the Humber and a new home. Anyway, after she was shipshape again, she sailed north to um, to UK uh, to her home port of Kingston on Hull. All credit to Mal, who loves dressing up, as you can see. He seeks good ways to use Pickle and fund the project for the future. Next year, she she's going to be moved to Grimsby to become the highlight of a new visitor centre. She's got an engine and steering wheel. The sails are new uh, and of the same canvas and the same cut that was used uh, in Nelson's Navy when they cost Mal a fortune. On deck, there are hemp ropes and belaying pins everywhere, and no, not a winch in sight. She has a 25 foot bowsprit, which is an accident waiting to happen. Once we were turning in a fairly confined area, we were just about to tangle with some moored boats, where the bowsprit was, when the harbourmaster came along and rescued us. That wasn't here, actually. There are eight cannons, one of which dates from uh, the 1790s. Broadsides and salutes uh, using thunder flashes are fired 
uh, given the least of excuses and air plugs are provided. And thunder flashes are quite effective really, both from the point of view of smoke and noise. Down below there's a good headroom, a comfortable saloon, and a reasonable accommodation for about nine people. Further off there's a chart room and a generous captain's cabin. So this pickle, not a replica, but it portrays the era, the pickle story, and the romance of sale. In uh, September 2017, and for reasons I really don't know, I was invited to join Pickle for a voyage. My association began on a wet October night in Hull. Mal recommended I brought a waterproof sleeping bag, and uh, I quite soon found out why. The decks leak. On the tide next morning, we set off on the 25th of October on a, a 655, 650 mile round trip to Portsmouth and back, calling at Harwich, uh, Dover and Eastbourne on the way. Uh, the purpose of the voyage was uh, at the request of the Navy and it was to lie close to HMS Victory uh, on Pickle Night a brilliant occasion to which we were all invited. Um, in Mal's crew, there was a hardcore of Hull men, and then there was Navy, and there was Marines, and there was me, 12 in all. The Navy and Marines all answered to colorful uh, nicknames. My particular buddy was Marine Warrant Officer Bacon, and who was always known as Russia. <laughs> The, the weather was extraordinarily kind, and when we wanted to go south, the wind was in the north, and when we wanted to go west, the wind went to the south. So we, the voyage went uh, proceeded more or less to plan, and no dolphins or whales, but lots and lots of wind turbines. So we had several pickles, uh, which started on day one, while hosting but uh, while hoisting the flying jib, the halyard somehow got caught around the upper yard and broke the end of it. Mal was very upset. Obviously, this had to be repaired before we got to Portsmouth because a topsail schooner without a topsail doesn't look right. So, in Harwich, we got the yard down and it was rotten and uh, obviously not preferable. So when we got to Dover, we went to B&Q and we bought some four by one and four by two and we glued it together. And next day we shaped it up. And then when we got to Eastbourne, we put the yard up again. And um, it looks okay, but we didn't dare use the sail because we weren't sure how strong our be B and Q special was. <laughs> there, there was another twist to this tale, because when we were in Dover, we were invited to the Royal San Sank Ports Yacht Club as guests of honour for their own pickle night. And uh, there was a chap there who came up to us, having heard of the mishap. He said, well, I've got a wood and I'll cut you a tree. So uh, we didn't think a lot of it, but he came down the next morning and said he needed some help. So he piled into his car, went to, to his wood, and we got the uh, sapling out. We put it on his bandsaw and we cut it to size and shaped it up a bit, put it on his car, <laughs> and um, went back to the ship. So now we had three upper yards. We've got the broken one, the B&Q one, and this one, which had some potential. We pickled again when we were leaving uh, Eastbourne's uh, Sovereign Harbour uh, at four o'clock in the morning and in the dark. It was low tide uh, and the channel outside we knew was silted and had minimal depth. So we had to stay in the middle of the channel, but unfortunately one of the starboard hand boys the light wasn't there. And so we misjudged the center of the channel. We went aground 
on the lee shore near the harbour entrance. The Mal was calm as a cucumber, but waited half an hour or so for the tide to rise, and then he backed off using starboard prop walk to get back into the channel. In mid-afternoon that day, he took on a pilot. We went to our mooring on Victory Pier, uh, as, um, <clears throat> as close as we could get to the flagship. We'd arrived on schedule ahead of Pickle Night. We assembled to celebrate Pickle Night on, on the 4th of November on, uh, on Victory's atmospheric lower gun deck. Mostly uh, warrant, are in war, uh, Navy warrant officers, but also Royal Marines in scarlet mess dress, and all presided over by Admiral Ben Key. First off, of course, there was a generous tot of rum, got things going, followed by dinner, uh, punctuated by Trafalgar dispatches, toasts, speeches, and shanties. One, one particular moment sticks in my mind. Harry, our navigator, who is a retired Navy clearance diver, when introduced, was holding the Queen's Gallantry Medal. There was an instant standing ovation. Now, on our voyage, Harry never talked about it. The voyage back north began on the following Wednesday with a decent northwesterly breeze. And Second Sea Lord Jonathan Woodcock came to see us off and presented Mao with a handsome print of Pickle and Victory sailing together. Having cleared the outer spit, we dropped off the pilot and set course for Dover, having decided to bypass Eastbourne this time. Uh, from two o'clock the following morning, I was uh, at the helm and had a thrilling uh, trick at the helm, charging through the night. It was now blowing about 30 knots from the north. And despite the proximity land, it was really quite rough. We were heeling to the wind, and I wondered about pickle stability. And I couldn't help eyeing the life raft, and wondering if it would work if, if we uh, needed it. We were safely in by 0400, guided to the inner harbor by the pilot launch. And amazingly, there were people there to take our lines. Next afternoon, we were off again across the Thames Estuary to Harwich, arriving again around 0400. Now, I don't know if anybody tried to go to Harwich at night. Um, I had the helm again from around 2.30, and it was difficult to pick out the channel because of the background of those all too bright lights on the, the Felix Stowe container port, particularly as our GPS was uh, not working and the steering hydraulics were playing up. And being colorblind, as well, such confidence. <laughs> and perhaps we were a little bit fortunate to arrive safely without any more pickles. On Saturday, the 11th of the 11th of November, we set off up the River Stour with full sail set to be off the Royal Hospital School at the 11th hour of the 11th month. We were there to fire a salute and cast a wreath. Uh, in a joint act of remembrance with the school who were lined up on their parade ground, which overlooks the river. It all went like clockwork. When asked afterwards how we managed to hold station with all sail set, we had to admit we'd come to a gentle halt in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the way down river that afternoon, we bombarded Harwich with several broadsides. But sadly, the only creatures who seemed to take any notice were the seagulls. The next morning, Max turned up, and together we said farewell to Mal and his crew. We'd worked and played together for nearly three weeks, and a strong bond had developed. And so back to Lamington in the comfort of a car. And now to the bar. <laughs> Somebody seems to have got there before us. Gosh, Jeremy, what a wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you on behalf of the club for a really, really good talk and sharing your knowledge. That's really special and I'm sure everybody here will remember it forever. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to ask you all to thank him in our usual way. Yeah.